Excellent. Well, thank you. And that was a very humbling introduction. Uh, I hope I can rise to the challenge now that you have set the stage. And, and, and again, I want to say uh, thank you uh, both to IGES for the opportunity to, to talk about how justice and public safety efforts can adapt, as you mentioned, given the massive technological disruption we're facing. And I really enjoyed when you opened up saying what we really are going to need is leadership and leadership from all parts of an organization and multiple organizations, because what we're experiencing is disruption unprecedented in human history. So. I'm going to ask the audience, please raise your hand if you want to be a leader, if you are a leader, if you want to continue to lead, given the changes in the world. Please raise your hand. All right. Now that you've raised your hand and said you want to be a leader, what if I tell you you're going to see more change in the next six years technologically and in terms of data compared to the next 20 years, the last 20 years we experienced? How many of you still want to be leaders? given that disruption, because that's what we're facing. And I would submit to you that good leaders handle friction. And think about that for a minute. There are some that say that the word leadership comes from the Greek word leet, which means to be sent unto death. This is usually when I ask audiences, do you still want to be leaders, knowing that part of being a leader is that you're being sent unto death? And why did the Greeks associate leading with being sent unto death? Well, that was because back in ancient Greece, the elites were the ones that carried the flag in front of the army. Now, these were ground armies. And when one ground army with a flag bearer in front of the army encounters another adversarial ground army carrying a flag, what's the first to happen? The flag bearers, the elites die. Now, hopefully you all will not have to physically die as leaders. But I raise that because this gets to why leaders handle friction. Because organizations oftentimes can be held back by what worked in the past. And so what a leader is doing is managing the friction between what we did in the past, what we're doing now, and what we need to do going forward. And I would ask now for the audience if you could please cross your arms, cross your arms, and now try crossing them the other way. And if you try crossing your arms a different way than you originally did, it feels uncomfortable. And that's a very small thing. But that's what leaders are asking organizations, asking communities, asking nations, and even asking the world to do, is they're asking people to do the uncomfortable thing that we're not used to, precisely because we have to do new things. We cannot keep on doing what we did. Now, there's an art and a discernment of what do we hold on to, what do we preserve, what do we cherish, but there's also an art to figuring out what do we let go of, what do we honor and say goodbye to, what loss do we process, because if we only maintain to the status quo, I will submit we are going to fall further and further behind. So with that thought on leadership, I will submit in the last 40 years, the good news is the United States and Western countries have democratized tech previously that was only available to the CIA and the KGB back in the 1970s. That's the good news is this is increasingly accessible and available. Now, of course, you know what the corollary is, is the bad news is we've democratized tech that was only available to the CIA and the KGB 40 years ago and have not upgraded how to do the work of defense, how to do the work of security, how to do the work of civil society, of justice, of public safety, given that we have now super empowered organizations, non-state actors, and people to be able to do what the CIA could do 40 years ago. That is the world you're facing. And so as we look at this, I'm gonna give you three trends and then talk about what does this really mean for what we have to do for justice and public safety. And again, please get ready with your questions because I'm really looking forward to an interactive conversation. I do feel a little bit like Max Headroom coming to you 20 minutes into the future by way of television, but this is meant to be an interactive session and I'm trying to help encourage us all to think about one, what is the landscape in which we need to be leaders? And then two, how can I just help empower leadership given these challenges? And so of course the first trend, trend as we already talked about is AI, artificial intelligence. It's everywhere. Now, 
I like to always pause and say, one, AI has been around since the late 1950s. So despite whatever the news media might make you think, it's been around for several decades. But what we're really talking about is what's called generative AI or gen AI, which uses deep learning. Now, we don't wanna to get too caught up on gen AI and deep learning, partly because the field is advancing rapidly. And also because the current technique using deep learning requires massive amounts of data and massive amounts of CPU cycles, but that's changing rapidly. One, there are more and more companies coming up with solutions that will allow you to do Gen AI locally. Um, one is just NVIDIA, but it's not the only one that can run things locally on your own PC. And two, there are new algorithms coming out that will not require as much data and not require as much CPU cycles. And of course, that's going to be both good and bad because that means we can use it for justice and public safety efforts. But that also means that bad actors can too. And of course, they will probably be a bit more creative and thinking ahead of how they use it. That said, the current model of what we're doing with Gen AI kind of is murky about where the data came from. It's kind of murky about intellectual property, which if you remember in the past, there used to be this thing called Napster which was also a little bit murky about where the IP was for the files they were distributing. It was eventually replaced by a more legitimate model, iTunes and others, the Amazon Music Store and things like that. But what's also interesting is this thing called active inference. And I raise it only to put on your radar that we don't want to get so fixated on the moment that we mix where things are going. And where things are going is more localized predictive artificial intelligence. Because the limits right now that they don't tell you with generative AI is it's only as good as the past training data that has been used on the model. Which if you're in a field that doesn't change that often, that's great. Or if you're in a field that doesn't care about truth and, and actual like facts, it could be more as a creative field. It could be music, it could be art. Those things are not really necessarily bounded by having to be accurate. But if you're in a field like law enforcement, if you're in a field like public safety, where I guarantee you tomorrow is probably not going to be exactly like yesterday was, there's going to be disruptions. The challenge with generative AI is it's not going to be as useful. But this active inference, which is coming around the corner, and there's companies that are already pioneering it right now, is the idea that I don't need to have one mega model that tries to answer everything. Instead, I can have localized approaches that are constantly actually competing to try and guess what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen tomorrow to inform your actions today. Now, it's worth wondering, though, because AI right now has having huge questions about how do we use it, how do we employ it, how do we involve it in our societies, and I would submit in some respects, tightly controlled autocracies that don't ask for public opinion, don't ask for companies to weigh in, may actually be able to adopt AI faster in the short term than more free and open societies like ours. And I'm not saying we should become autocracies by any stretch of the imagination. I celebrate our freedoms. But that is the pressure we're facing, which is in this new, I don't want to call it a Cold War, but this new geopolitical challenge we face, Whereas in the first Cold War between us and USSR, we just simply had to be faster than the USSR. In this new world we're going into, our very freedoms and openness and deliberativeness may actually slow us down in the short term relative to autocracies that will just seize on the moment. And if you don't like it, you're fired, you're imprisoned and or killed. And so the question is, how do we upgrade the business of doing the work that we do in justice and public safety in free societies to be able to keep up with this technological change? The second trend, the second of three trends we're facing is increasing collisions between data and globalization. On the left-hand side, you see the valuation of the top 10 companies as of a few weeks ago. Now, on the right-hand side, you see the GDP of the top 10 wealthiest nations. And it's interesting because the combined market cap of those data-intensive companies, and you know those data-intensive companies, I won't call them out by name, but those data-intensive companies is about equal to the GDP of all nations in the world combined, minus the top four. 
We are now in a world dramatically different than the 80s, 90s, and even 2000, where there are a handful of companies, when you combine their annual revenues, that exceed the GDP, the revenue equivalent of all nations, minus the top four. That's their market cap plus their revenue combined exceeds those of all nations. And so we now have outsized private sector actors on the world stage, and of course, impacting what we do nationally and locally. Yet at the same time, most organizations that are not in that top 10 list still need to get the digital fundamentals first. I'm talking cybersecurity. I'm talking just general moving off of legacy systems. Um, I know several of us in the room here have had to deal with legacy IT systems because that's the nature of what we do. And usually we launch an IT system and maybe we'll check on it 10 years in, 15 years in, maybe even 20 years in. But if it's working, why do the messy work of trying to upgrade it? But these are challenges. And I would submit on top of it, even those big companies I talked about that are data intensive, that are having a very large market cap, are operating off what last decade taught people, which was supposedly data is the new oil. And I'm gonna challenge you and say data is definitely not the new oil. Oil, you use it, it's gone. Data, you use it, it's still there. Data is actually something that the more you get the people actually associate with the data to use it, the communities involved with it to use it, you actually get better data. You actually get better value in how the data is used. But we have to unlearn those lessons that somehow data is to be hoarded, data is to be hoovered up without people sort of fully acknowledging what's being done. And I would submit in free societies, data is a form of voice for people. And if you have little or no choices in how that data is employed, especially for public safety and justice efforts, you may have lost the ability to have free speech. And that's a concern that we need to face, especially in this era in which data and AI is becoming more and more pervasive. Data is not the new oil, hoarding it breeds distrust. And so the question for us, the really hard question for free societies is how can we involve communities in making sense of their data for the purposes of law enforcement or public safety? Because otherwise, I guarantee you, you're setting up an us versus them divide that will be either subject to a disinformation attack or some other wedge that actually pulls people apart as opposed to brings them together. So the second trend I will ask you to think about and reflect upon is how can US justice and public safety efforts better use new tech? And simultaneously, we must adhere to the Constitution. And again, the Constitution was written in a time in which nobody really thought about data and AI for some mysterious reason. And so there's going to be a lot of questions about what's done at the state level versus federal level. There's going to be lots of questions about what are the rights of individuals and how do we mesh our existing laws with what is increasingly a fast-paced digital realm. All right, the final three of three trends. I don't think I necessarily have to tell you this audience too much other than to say things aren't going great in the cybersecurity realm. Um, I would ask people, raise your hand if you think we're winning in the cybersecurity battle. I, I, I think we are increasingly facing, in fact, if anything, more challenges, again, because we're democratizing both the good things that we can do, but we're also democratizing the toolkits, unfortunately, that allow people to do cybersecurity exploits and the like. Ransomware damages in 2019 were estimated globally at about $11 billion. Fast forward to 2020, it was now up to $20 billion in global damages. 2021 was now $43 billion. That's the last time they actually did an estimate. But we're seeing things almost double each year in terms of the severity of ransomware attacks. As you can see, the amount of payoffs, payouts that they're looking for are going up, but also just the general pervasiveness and the overall global damages are getting worse. Cybersecurity is only going to be more complicated by the rise of generative AI, because what generative AI is really good at is producing realistic looking, yet inauthentic or fake content. That includes images, audio, and videos. That's going to be used to generate fraud. I've seen, for example, in less than 10 minutes using what's called Worm GPT, that's the dark side cousin of ChatGPT plus some plugins, 
you can generate in less than 10 minutes 1 million realistic looking claims for Medicare for upper respiratory infection for actual patient records that have been manufactured, they look realistic, and chest x-rays that actually look realistic as well. And they're at $200 a piece, which is below the fraud detection threshold for Medicare claims. It's more expensive to adjudicate the claim than to pay that off. And think about that, a million in less than 10 minutes. Now, let's say you wait till November and maybe you submit only half of those. So you submit 500,000, but 500,000 cases of upper respiratory infection in November or December, sadly may just get lost to the noise unless we figure out a better way to adjudicate those small claims that are probably gonna be manufactured and faked. But that also raises interesting questions because we're also seeing as more and more people use Wi-Fi enabled video cameras, guess what the attackers are doing? They're knocking out the Wi-Fi signal and therefore knocking out the video feed. We've also seen increasingly hardware be faked. Without naming any names, there was a government entity that had a router that pretended to be a Cisco router. Um, they sent it back to Cisco multiple times. Cisco said everything is good. And then it turned out that actually on the third attempt, it was not actually a Cisco router. It was a Huawei router in disguise. How many of us are checking to see if our hardware is actually valid versus pretending to be something it's not? And then sadly, we know again with, 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 you know, hackers are going after everybody. It's not just public school students, but some of our most vulnerable segments of the population, both elder care, but public school students are seeing their data get compromised. And that raises challenging questions about how they may be either extorted or that data might be used for identity theft. So having considered those three trends, how can we find solutions that will detect AI bots, generative AI being used that's pretending to be something it's not, but still adhere to the values of the Constitution, given that we don't want to lose the values and freedoms we have for individuals in our free society. So now I'm gonna step back and say, what do these massive changes mean? Well, in 1969, there were all of four nodes that made up the ARPANET. Fast forward to 1982, the United States is getting connected. 1993, the US and Europe are getting connected. This is still pre-World Wide Web. For those who remember Archie and Gopher protocols, that was 1993. 2007, this is broadband connections that make up the internet. They gave up trying to draw borders of countries on the map. 2007 was also the year where there was as many, if not more, mobile broadband connections as there were fixed landline broadband connections. 2007, this is the internet that they knew back then, and they gave up even trying to draw it on a map altogether. And then by 2013 to 2014, we went from 7.1 billion network devices on the planet relative to 7.1 billion human beings. And in 11 years, we're up to now 45 billion network devices on the planet. And fortunately, just 8.1 billion human beings. But we are now the minority both in terms of the number of devices that make up the planet. And similarly, 2013 was a year in which there was more bot traffic on the internet than there was human traffic. And it's stayed that way ever since. Again, just to give you a sheer sense of size, I'm recognizing and hoping that several in the audience knows what internet protocol version four was, IPv4. As you may know, we ran out of those numbers about three and a half years ago. But that was 2.3, sorry, 2 to 32 numbers, 4.3 billion addresses, give or take, that you could use to look up things on the internet. But we ran out of those numbers about three and a half years ago. So we had to move to Internet Protocol version six. Now, Internet Protocol version four, if we take those 4.3 billion addresses that made up the internet you knew, give or take about three or four years ago, any guesses as to the corresponding size object for Internet Protocol version six? We're going from the beach ball to the size of the sun. The internet you knew, the internet we have been serving to try and both protect, defend, ensure privacy and civil liberties on over the last 20 years was the size of the beach ball. The internet we are now heading into and, in, and wrapping our arms around is the size of the sun. These are massive technological changes. So amidst all this, the human factor, Bad actors will similarly continue to use tech to attack US national strengths in ways that we cannot similarly do. What a bad actor does using the tech, we can't. 
given the Constitution. So we need new strategies. Amidst this backdrop as well, not just in the United States, we're seeing it in Netherlands, Australia, Sweden, and Great Britain. 2018, a Pew study found that the number of young people in the United States who preferred capitalism to be less than 45%, and less than 20% thought a military coup was wrong if the government is perceived as incompetent. And again, this is not just a US phenomenon. This is a Western phenomenon writ large. With inflation, sadly, COVID-19's economic recovery has been K-shaped, meaning some are as good, if not better off than they were before COVID, but a lot of people are worse off than they were before COVID, isolating several people and increasing loneliness. Increasing polarization in our own country, a 2020 study, again, I'm nonpartisan, but it found that both parties, more than 85% of the members of both parties perceive the other side as actively harming the nation. And those are very strong words. We have multiple regional conflicts, whether they be in Ukraine, whether they be with Palestine and Gaza, whether they be with the Red Sea, whether it be with the South Pacific, we are going into a world in which we probably will have five to six geopolitical regional conflicts upwards from the one that we had two years ago, the three that we had at the beginning of this year, six by the end of the year, Meanwhile, we know that China's own economy is slowing, which raises interesting questions about what will China do in response to a slowing economy. For public safety and law enforcement, for thinking about justice efforts, we have to deter abuses of Gen AI. And we're just getting our handle on this technology, and I guarantee you it's going to move faster than we can keep ahead of it, but we've got to think strategically. Now, deterrence is focusing on the human actors that will use Gen AI either to break the law or to hurt or harm people. I am not assuming that Gen AIs are, are thinking like people. In fact, despite what people tell you, this is just fancy mathematics. That's all generative AI is. Do not ascribe any personality or consciousness to the machine. It's just mathematics. Stopping the Gen AI systems themselves, it's equivalent to a cyber system where we can actually do different strategies. If you want to disrupt a cyber system, you could block it. You could try to confuse the algorithm. There's a thing called data poisoning, in which if you feed to certain generative AI systems outputs that itself produced, that will actually corrupt the system. And of course, last, last, if you really had to do something, an EMP boost, an electronic magnetic pulse, despite people tell you about AI taking of the world, we kind of have that handled if that was ever to happen, and it's not. But that's what you would do for the cyber system. What I'm thinking about is how does public safety, how do justice efforts deter the human actors, whether they be individuals or non-state or criminal syndicates that are going to be using Gen AI to break the law and to actually cause harms to others. Nations will need to actually track both foreign and non-state AI threats. So it's gonna require us to work again with defense partners, Homeland Security partners, as well as what we do in terms of law enforcement and public safety. And the biggest risk of AI is not existential. I would submit the biggest risk for what we're facing in the next five to 10 years is that the commons, the things that make us a collective society, the connections that hold free societies together will be abused, will be corrupted. And if we lose what holds us together, what makes us trust each other to the point where we're willing to coexist, if we lose that, we may lose our very free society. These abuses could include flooding the zone with disinformation, misinformation, mass impersonations, trying to pretend people who are not, corrupting the quality of data feeds needed by free societies to operate. I'll give you just one small example. I'm part of a nonpartisan group that started about six months ago that is looking at how elections might be messed with using Gen AI. And we're seeing right now search engine optimization. If you remember, search engines generally in the past could assume that the most linked to websites were trustworthy or authoritative, or at least something that could actually be of use to a person searching for something. But with Gen AI, in less than 15 minutes, I can create 15,000 web pages that are each slightly different that all point to the same search result. And guess what the search engine does? it makes that the top most result when you type in a keyword. It's a combination of keyword squatting and search engine amplification, misuse and abuse, to try and get your results to be number one, two, and three. Such that when COVID happened back in 2020, 
if you were of a certain minority demographic group in the United States, if you were black or Hispanic, and you looked for COVID vaccine, and you were looking for information, for whatever reason, domestic or foreign, unclear, the top search results that showed up for you were not actually authoritative search results, but things that pointed to Russia's own Sputnik vaccine. And again, the search engines were just simply doing what they were doing, but that was being misused and abused to lead people into places that were not good information for them to consider. So bad actors will continue to exploit this. We are drowning in an increasingly inauthentic, hard to make sense content. It's only gonna get harder with video and media. And so it raises questions, how will we deal with this? Again, just to give you a sense of the size of the challenge, one petabyte of data back in 2012 took six server racks. In less than five years, instead of taking six server racks to store one petabyte of data, it was one server blade. Before the end of the decade, one petabyte of data probably will be in the palm of your hand, if not on your phone, which raises massive questions about how that power will be wielded as well as extorted. We will have to democratize the tradecraft of what I call information discernment. Again, CIA has 15,000 people. Different intelligence components have lots of people that spend weeks trying to discern what's really going on, what's truth and what's not truth. But most of us as individuals, let alone organizations, don't have 15,000 people to try and analyze what is real and what's not real. And we've also got to figure out, again, for free societies, how do we upgrade digital dignity consistent with the Constitution? Before I go to questions, I just want to give you this framework, which is we have to figure out how do we counter generative AI abuses associated with national defense. There's going to be different players in that space, public safety, intelligence, and diplomacy. How do we actually counter generative AI abuses relative to breaking the law? That's going to obviously be law enforcement and justice systems, as well as domestic regulatory. And then civil norms. You haven't broken a law, but you really are violating the norms that make our free society operate. That's going to be a combination of local communities and networks, diplomacy, and professional societies, because we're going to be dealing with actors that span the gamut from domestic, non-state, to foreign. And so as we look at it, we've got to be able to demonstrate credible costs to deter human actors that are going to be misusing and abusing generative AI. We must be able to correctly attribute who did what. That's hard. And we must not lose the public trust in the process while we are trying to help protect and defend them. So things we're going to have to think about is how can we improve the identification of generative AI as well as behaviors of actors using generative AI, almost like a behavioral intelligence? How can we work with internet service providers and platforms to limit the lateral movement of generative AI or the movement of generative AI if it's seen as bad, but at the same time not do censorship? Because if we do censorship, then we've fallen down the rabbit hole of looking more and more autocratic. We can't do that. And finally, we may have to figure out interesting ways to involve the public. And in Australia, they've been experimenting what's called citizen juries as a part of an oversight mechanism where people are randomly selected and said, good news. Since you have been willing and volunteered for the next 12 months, you will help with oversight for this activity as a member of the public. That's what Australia is doing. We may need to do that here. But we've got to upgrade our national privacy protections. We haven't done that. You've seen certain states do this, but if we have each 50 different states with a different privacy protection, that's going to be really difficult to navigate. We're going to have to figure out ways to involve people in their data, be stakeholders, perhaps data cooperatives for the public. And maybe we actually need to have a way that almost like you have a neighborhood tip system or a neighborhood watch system. Do we need to crowdsource the spotting or tips for generative AI abuse as a way to involve the public? As we close, it's got to be a whole of society solution to these issues. And I submit that we need more operational non-government organizations, nonprofits like I just, I was not paid to say this, but I think right now we are lacking operational nonprofits. We have plenty of nonprofits that admire the issue. They write papers about it and then they move on to the next paper. But what we really need are operational ones that can tackle these issues and actually try to actually put them into practice because this cannot certainly be done by government alone. We may need to launch organizations that can allow replays of what's actually happening in the real world because we lack that foundation. We've got to learn of risk associated with generative AI relative to public safety and law enforcement. We've got to simulate scenarios and we have to test new tools. 
as we close, though, again, I don't want to say we're winning in cyber. We don't want to focus too much on generative AI and miss the fact that we're still not winning on protecting people from cyber harms, including cyber scams and extortion. We do need to figure out tools that actually empower the individuals and the people to actually identify for themselves what they consider to be truth or what they want to actually consider to be better information. Because again, we can't have the government do that for people, including the reporting of generative AI misuses and abuses. And we can't have a heavy handed approach. We can't force generative AI underground. So maybe we need to borrow a playbook from the 1930s where we had people, if you were an amateur radio operator, you had to get a license. Maybe we need to do the same thing for generative AI. Maybe we need certified AI professionals that actually are taking an oath to do certain things, take an ethical oath, much like a doctor. And then there's actually some professional society norms that uphold them to that standard in addition to what we do. And again, finally, I can't emphasize this enough. We have to have places where the public can trust a nonprofit or a lab to put into practice some of these things. Because again, the government can't do it alone, but we have to do so in a way that's non-political, that's non-partisan. So maybe what we need is bipartisan oversight to protect ourselves from disinformation attacks that are at least domestic. Maybe we need to have these nonprofits that say, look, we want you not just to explore possibilities in this space, but assuming you get to go ahead to pursue, actually put into practice some of these things working with local and state partners. So I'll close there and I'm looking forward to your questions and I'll just urge you to all be leaders and most importantly, please be bold, please be brave, most importantly, please be benevolent for our future ahead. Thank you. All right, I look forward to your questions now. All right, thank you so much, David. I told you he was gonna be thought provoking. I can't even imagine the amount of data and information that he's put in our presentation. And David, interestingly enough, I was having a correspondence via text message with our folks to make sure we have a copy of your slides because that in of course, and of itself yes, is I will share a huge. copy of the slides. Yes, you have it. All right, cool. So questions from the audience. All right, we're we're gonna trip somebody over that because I know when we start this, and I can call on individuals. <laughs> Okay, is uh, Rick Dale in the room? And I'm saying that deliberately. I'm saying it deliberately. Um, Maria, I have a quick question, or more more of an observation. You, you ended the presentation with a comment around trust and nonprofits. What? How much thought have you or anyone else given to maybe what's that deterioration level look like presently, and what steps can organizations take? not only to repair trust, but maybe just ensure what, what they have at the moment? Great question, and yes. So uh, the reason why I called that out is a recent survey, as recent as about four months ago, was looking at what places members of the US public still trust. Um, the good news is, um, while trust in government is low, it's not as low as it was in the 1900s, if that gives you any solace. We've actually been lower. I'm not saying we wanna go there. Um, but trust in government is low. It's about 22, 23%. Trust in private sector companies, particularly tech companies, is low too, which is a massive change from just about five or six years ago. We're living the tech lash. So private sector companies aren't trusted either. The two places right now that by and large the US public still trust are universities and nonprofits. It's about 50%, which is the top of the scale at the moment. Um, and I think the reason why you're seeing an erosion of distrust is this is actually something not new. Um, back, imagine if I told you there was a time in human history where there was rapid technological progress, um, there was a rise of mega corporations, including some ultra wealthy individuals that may or may not have waded into public politics. Um, there were newspapers that sold disinformation. They had sensationalistic headlines that did not match the actual articles. And the US may have gone to war with Spain over a disinformation event. For those of you who remember history, it was called Remember the Maine. Um, and as I mentioned, Congress was actually more polarized than it was now. That was the 1890s and the 1900s. So we've had this pattern before. We got out of it. Sadly, it took World War I, Great Depression, and World War II, which I'd like to avoid. But I think what I'm trying to find is where are those places that still have a semblance of trust that can actually bring together communities? And the nice thing is if you do universities and nonprofits, at the regional level, you may be able to bring together stakeholders and actually meet face to face 
And then if you have a bipartisan oversight board, you prevent any, no, I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but you have less likely that any member of Congress is gonna try and grandstand on whatever is being done there. You still will probably have foreign disinformation attacks, but I think that's what's gonna be needed to be done because otherwise I don't see any place that the public is willing to trust to try and actually get ahead of these issues. Next question. We're getting one, David, hang on. No worries. David, this, this is Paul Wormley. It's I was gonna say, to Paul, I'm assuming you're gonna have a question. It's great to hear you. It's great to hear you. And thank you so much for this very exciting uh, presentation. And you certainly have nailed the, the what's facing us all. But, uh, and I love your idea that nonprofits can play a role and particularly nonprofits like I just, but uh, I'm, I, I'm, motivated to to uh, see to it that I just responds in some way but I'm really curious to know if you have any thoughts about what are the the top priorities for an organization like I just to do to start down this path of becoming the kind of leadership that you're suggesting we should be what do we do first yep where's the journey of a thousand miles so great question I would say the two things I'm seeing that's absent in this space is one, just data on the actual threats. So the last data point we have on the misuse of generative AI for fraud purposes is 2022, in which we're seeing dramatic updates, and that's 2022. As you know, it's 2024. So one thing that could be done fairly simply is that I just could actually say to our different stakeholders, what's a very rapid, quick pulse we could do to get a sense at the state level. Maybe we're pulling together state attorney generals. Maybe we're pulling together state representatives. Maybe we're even going to governors and briefing them. Because right now, realistically, it's a US election year. I would not wait for the federal government to show up because they're kind of distracted right now. But involve things at the state level that is relevant to the states to just get a handle on the state of the problem. And I will share, um, so I'm a member of what's called the Stop Scams Alliance. And we are fairly sure that scams are actually at least 50 times, if not much larger than ransomware in terms of damages to the US public. And we have just succeeded in getting Gallup to actually add to its questions when it does its Gallup survey. And we're trying to get the Census Bureau to the same, to say, have you or a family member been impacted by a scam, an online scam? Because we think that's actually a worse sort of whole society thing that's happening. And you can only imagine that's gonna be upgraded by what generative AI can do in terms of scams. But I think the first step you could do is just get a handle on the scope of the problem, because as you know, Paul, once you can actually present that to your state governor, once you can actually present that to your state AG, once you can present that to the federal government and say, here's the size of the problem, then you can actually say, and here's what we need to do about it. But if you don't have those metrics, then you're peering into the void and saying, we think this is a problem, we have anecdotes, but it's kind of hard to position. The nice thing about that too is you don't have to ask anybody's permission to do that. It's a space where nobody is doing something, it plays into what IGES is good at. Just get a sense of it and then make that data visible to state representatives, to the federal government, as well as the public and say, we think these are challenges that we are seeing a dramatic uptick on and we've got to get ahead of them because if we don't figure out a whole society response, this may pull us apart. David, I have a question while a couple of other people are getting their nerve up. Um, your experience with these uh, various coalitions, organizations, et cetera, what are you interpreting as the U.S. view of this issue? Meaning, are, are, we, are we leading uh, internationally? And I, I know the answer to that part, but uh, do, you, do we have a presence internationally that we are actually assessing this issue and wanting to address it, or is it this sort of bottom-up approach that we as individual organizations, communities, uh, individuals are saying, this is a problem when we need to coalesce and, and organize a group to do so. Right, so great question. Are we leading at the moment? No, we're trying or we're giving the semblance, but we're not. And that's partly one because we have an election year coming up. So as you know, everybody's busy focusing on that as opposed to doing stuff, which is part of the liability of our system is every four years we like go on hold and then we pick back up. So we'll see what happens in 2025. But I was part of a group 
that looked at, in August of 2023, so about a little bit more than six months ago, at the time there were 54 different nations with different national AI strategies. And we looked at the similarities and the differences of their national AI strategies. And what was interesting is the US's strategy was most like, I'm gonna pause, US's strategy was most like China's. And what does that mean? Well, both China and the United States are seeing AI as something to double down in terms of talent, in terms of workforce recruitment, in terms of fundamental R&D, very similar. Neither country is talking anything about preventing harms to society. Of course, China's response to harms to society is what harms? We censor everything or we filter it and it's our job to do that for you. The US is absent to that. Now, the difference, of course, is in the execution of the same strategy. The US's strategy is obviously we're going to use the free market, we're going to use incentives to try and encourage high school graduates, um, college graduates to go into AI fields, but that's still a long tail. China's strategy is simply telling their equivalent of high school and college graduates that, guess what, you're going to do AI for the rest of your life, whether you like it or not. And so they're doing brute force and they have massive scale. And so there isn't someone getting ahead of the harms rationally. There's plenty of discussion at the national stage where people talk about AI doomsday, AI is somehow going to take over the world. I worry that that is either hyperbole for the purposes of getting clicks or views, or worse, it's a playbook again from the first Gilded Age that we had in the 1890s, where people may have used scare tactics to try and prevent other railroad startups from entering the railroad space. And I hope that's not the case, but there there is precedent for that. And so in this area in which we're not taking a leadership presence um, and we are not really thinking about how this is going to be a way that we upgrade how we live as free societies consistent with the Constitution, I think it's going to have to be a bottoms-up approach. But I do think there is an opportunity that if you can present the size and scope of the problem to the federal government, you can make it so they say, okay, great, now we'll actually do something about it. Because I submit that as a result of the democratization of technology, again, going back to my opening premise, which was the last 40 years, you now can do with your phone what the CIA could do only 40 years ago. Your phone can talk to anybody in the world at the moment's notice. You have GPS. If you want, you can download. There's several apps you can download, and you can actually pull up satellite photos that are as recent as 15 minutes ago. In the United States right now, it is legal for commercial companies to sell you satellite footage accurate to 0.25 meters. And again, CIA would have loved to have that not just 40 years ago, they would have loved to have that 20 years ago. But now that's available to individuals, as well as, of course, those that break the law. And so since you're now in this world, we designed a government that at most the White House, the executive office of the president could deal with two to three large issues at a time, what I call watermelon issues. But we're now in a world in which there's 20 to 30 watermelon issues. And the government can't deal with all of them. It's not designed to deal with them all. And so the only way we can continue to deal with this is we get the go ahead from the government to say, look, I now am willing to let you run with it because you've convinced me of the scope of the problem. You've convinced me that you can assemble stakeholders. And as a result, help me with this one watermelon because I've got these other 20 watermelons that I have to pay attention to. And if they have that trust in you, I think that's the only way to remain free societies. Uh, David, my name's Brian Griffith. I work with the FBI Sieges Division. I'd just like to hear your thoughts. Um, it's been my observation that legislation and policy that's coming out um, from not only the federal government, but also state governments, seems to be focused on limiting law enforcement's use of AI, yes. ignoring, quite honestly, <laughs> other yeah. uses or even predatory uses of, of AI. Um, almost feeling like going back to, we had a conversation yesterday about the trust issue and uh, maybe we shouldn't call ourselves law enforcement, but more policing. That was a great conversation yesterday, but I'd like to hear you talk just a, a moment about that, whether you see that as a real phenomenon or am I just imagining it? Cause I feel no. like I'm on the <laughs> tip of the spear on that. Uh, you you are on the tip of the spear. I've been on the tip of the spear with you from the intelligence side, where supposedly you know you know you know as you know, um, there's a lot of disinformation about what folks in government are actually doing to protect the public. And 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 as as I like to tell people, there's a reason when you go to court, they ask you to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
The most effective disinformation does two out of the three, but gets one of the other ones completely off kilter. And so we have experienced a loss of trust. Um, and that's in some respects result of things that, you know, that, that's a trend that's been happening for the last 20 years. And I think it's actually part of the U.S.'s ethos. Remember, we had a, you know, we our nation was born as a result of revolution against the king-like individual. The U.S. is never going to trust anybody who looks like they're an authority. And that's part of our ethos, you know, unlike our counterparts in Canada and Australia and the United Kingdom, where they had a more peaceful change in monarchies. And so recognizing the world in which the U.S. operates, we will always be distrustful of an authoritarian figure. I think it's a combination of both bad actors, domestic and foreign, that just want to stoke the fire of you can't trust these people. But it's also the tech companies want to distract from the fact that they are actually collecting a whole lot more than what the government is doing. And, and so, yes, you're right. A lot of legislation right now is binding both our hands and our feet in terms of what we can do for public safety. I do think we have to be very conscious and intentional in our words. Um, that's why I prefer the word public safety to say homeland security, because homeland security makes certain people get a little nervous. And I'm like, public safety is, you know, who can argue against that? But regardless, I think this is where we may need to borrow a playbook from like Australia, where they have citizen juries, where they say, you know, you can sign up if you want to be part of this oversight mechanism and we will randomly pick the people. And so, and you share those profiles. You may not share the names, but say, look, we have somebody who is a single uh, parent uh, provider. We have someone else that's a stay-at-home mom. These are people who are helping give oversight as representatives in this effort. You know, again, they're not doing the technology, but every two months, three months, we are briefing them about what we're doing. We let them ask questions. And if they have serious concerns, they are representing you as members in this. Because I don't think you're ever going to be able to succeed in convincing the U.S. public to say, trust us, just on that matter of fact. But if you involve stakeholders that look like them, sound like them, that they feel like comes from whatever background they're at, they can say that on their on your behalf. But I do think we have to figure out this strategy because, yes, I'm watching what's happening and I'm seriously concerned we are tying our arms and tying our legs and missing the fact that bad actors, both domestic and foreign, are racing ahead and we will not be able to respond in the same way. And uh, that's going to be harmful both in the short term to individuals and communities and then harmful to the nation in the long term. David, this is Ashwini. Um, quick question. We talk a lot about leadership, right? So I know, you, I know you and I have had a brief conversation on this topic. There's just so many variations of leadership. And if we just go around, we'll get. So from what you see, um, not just in US, internationally, what the next generation of leaders need to do to be successful? Because I think we have we are one type of a leader today, things might be changing on a dime yep. today or tomorrow, right? So can you talk about some of the key attributes the next generation of leadership have so we can actually overcome some of the challenges you talked and briefly touched on the idea of convergence, right? Sure. So that's one question. And then I have a second part question. So why don't you just add, share your thoughts on like the thoughts on next generation leadership? Of course. So, Yes. Um, so on leadership, I subscribe to the school of thought that the best kind of leaders are adaptive leaders. Exactly. As you said, they 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 switch what the moment needs. Um, the best leaders do not say, follow me. That's actually not leadership. That's management. Uh, they don't tell people what to do. Again, that's management. Um, and it's worth distinguishing the difference between management and leadership. Management is when you're both managing people's expectations and you are also managing what people perceive of you. So it could be what your boss expects of you, could be what your peers think of you and expect of you, could be what your reports expect of you, could be what the public or the Congress expects of you. We all have to do management to a degree. Leadership is when you step outside of those expectations. And that's why I again say good leaders manage friction because when you step outside the expectations of someone, whether it's the expectations of your boss, your peers, your reports, or expectations of the public or the Congress, now you're in hot water. And you've got to have a strategy to manage that. Um, you know, I mean, you know, it, it, if you're and, and, and I appreciate the very gracious introduction you did at the, at the beginning, but I would say if you're receiving awards, you're not leading. And again, we all have to do some sort of management or we're quickly out of a job. Leadership generally at the time is creating a little bit of friction that's manageable because there's plenty of people that go in and they break things and they never put it back together. You've got to have a strategy for managing it because you're, you're, you're making people do things that are uncomfortable because they want you to get back in your box or they want you to go back to what you're used to doing or what they wanted you to do. And you're saying, no, 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 the situation requires me to do something different. 
And so that gets back to Paul's question, which is the first thing a leader does is probably help begin to make things more obvious to others so that it becomes self-evident to them that there's a problem here as opposed to you telling them. Um, when I was at the Federal Communications Commission, they had had nine CIOs in eight years, which is always a great sign for CIO number 10, that things are just going great. Um, and and I, I intentionally use Socratic questions when I met with my team, when I met with members of different bureaus and offices, even when I talked to Congress as much as I could, I said, you know, what do you think the problem is here? What's going on here? Why haven't we succeeded in the past? And there were multiple reasons. Um, and you had to sort of bring them along because if you tell people what to do, then that's management and they may not like it um, or, or it's not lasting and it's not getting them to where they want to go. At the same time, sometimes the best leaders have to be willing to quote unquote, proverbially die. Um, at the Federal Communications Commission, we did succeed in moving everything the FCC had to either public cloud or private hosting in less than two and a half years. But some of the biggest attractors were actually the people who were used to doing things a certain way with a certain process that when we moved to cloud, instead of taking two weeks to get done, it can now be done in 30 minutes. But they were threatened because they're like, well, what's my job now? I don't really want to retrain. And are you going to put me out of a job? And AI is going to be kind of like that too. So you have to be aware of managing the perceived friction and the perceived loss. And I'll fast forward even more. Um, while I was at the FCC, there was two high profile proceedings, one in 2014, one in 2017. And most public agencies received less than 10,000 comments. Less than 1% received more than 10,000 comments. The time in 2014, the FCC received 2.3 million comments. So that's clearly above the standard deviation, including 1.3 million in the last week of a 120 day commenting period. Do I think they're all real? No. But I had asked, I said, could I use capture to block bots? And they said, no, because if someone can't see and can't hear, they might not be able to do it. Can I use reCAPTCHA, which is invisible to the user? No, because that's kind of surveillance like. It's like, well, could I block obvious spam defined as 100 comments a minute from the same IP address? And it's like, no, you can't do that either because maybe one of the 100 comments is real. So like, this is going to be fun. So when we did that in 2014, come 2017, when they were going to address the same high profile issue, again, I asked, can I use CAPTCHA? Can I block bots? And again, the lawyers came back and said, nope, you can't. It's like, this is going to be fun. And Vince Cerf was a friend, and he said, you know, you're probably going to get a massive flood that's going to actually cause not a denial of service at the network layer, but at the application layer. I said, yep, probably are. And sure enough, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. in the morning U.S. Eastern time, we're getting 6,000 comments a minute. Do I think they're all human? No. But the very legal interpretations I had been given at the commission prevented me from doing anything that could actually filter, detect, or deter bots. And we ended up, instead of 2.3 million comments, which is what we got in 2014, we got 23 million. So 10x increase in less than three years comments. Now, at the time, the chairman's office said, is this a denial of service? Again, I talked to Vince Cerf earlier, who kind of knows something about TCP IP since he helped invent it. And I said, you know, everything's fine at the network layer. Nothing's been compromised. But effectively, yes, this is a denial of service at the application layer. And I did not know at the time and only found out in 2021, but basically, well, I, I got a sense very quickly because both sides of the aisle were like, well, where's your evidence? I'm like patterns of life, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. Well, that's not forensics. I was like, I don't think I need forensics. But anyway, um, after they said, well, nothing ever happened, both sides of the aisle said nothing ever happened and I must have been wrong. I just kept on going and smiling. Come 2021, the New York Attorney General concluded of the 23 million comments we got, at least 18 million were bot generated and bot submitted. And that was from 2017. At least 18 of the 23 million were bot generated and bot submitted. 9 million from one side of the aisle, 9 million from the other side of the aisle. And that was domestically sourced, at least 18 of the 23 million. And that was 2017. So as we look at 2024 onwards, I'm also talking to other people that actually, their universities that track what goes on the major social media platforms. And one of the things they have observed is for more than 50% of the countries in the world, the top 300 most active accounts, the ones that are most followed and most active, none of them are actual humans. They're all bot generated accounts. And that's for more than half of the world. So again, for law enforcement, as we think about leadership, you're gonna to have to understand the technology, but you're also gonna to have to be able to discern what's real and what's not real. I'm talking to both UK and US governments where they are very, concern that by 2030, if not sooner, it'll be almost impossible to discern what's real and what's not real in the public space. That's the world we're facing. So I hope that helps.
Thanks. And, and actually, you answered part of my next question. And since you brought Vince Surf, I was going to ask you to uh, share your thoughts uh, with the folks because we talk a lot about trust. And your example is who to trust because I can change my identity anytime in this, uh, I will say, cyber world, right? So can you quickly share your thoughts, the role that identification technology, ID verification plays as we move forward, not just with AI, there's other technology that we haven't touched yet. So can you just share quickly the role that identification technology is going to play in this space? Yep. Um, so the good news is there are ways you can try and assert your identity. Now, your face increasingly is not going to be that way. Your biometrics may not even be that way because they're going to be easy to capture. But a multifactorial approach, the way you walk, the way you type, um, there are certain patterns of life. You know, if you put them all together, it's, it's, it's a way that you can have increased confidence that it really is you. But as you know, and I think everybody here is probably seeing, we're seeing scammers for as little as $10,000 impersonate the voice, and you only need 15 seconds of someone's voice to impersonate a phone call that makes it sound like them. They call an elderly family member, they say, I'm in an accident, I need money wired, and the family member does it for as little as $10,000 because, Thanks to all the big Gen AI tools, unless you get 15 seconds of someone's voice and you can make it sound like them. And then if you use voice over IP, you can spoof the telephone number to look like it's coming from them too. Um, and so, uh, yes, Vince Cerf is a longtime friend. You know, he's happy that, you know, we've unleashed the internet, but that also means all the good and the bad have come with it. And so for law enforcement, this is going to be an interesting challenge because as you try to do attribution of who is doing what and where is something being sourced from, it's going to be difficult. And at the same time, we can't do what more authoritarian nations do, which is they issue a digital national ID system that's run by the government and policed by the government. You know, if we do that, we're kind of no longer true to the values of the Constitution, which means we've got to figure out ways where people can choose when and where they want to to assert this is how I'm going to prove who I am. This is who I have. This is this is who I am. But choose. There may be times when you want to be anonymous or what times you want to be semi-anonymous or what's called differential privacy, where I'm not going to tell you my birth date, but I'm going to have a way to cryptographically prove that I am at least over the age of 21, even if I don't tell you my exact age. And that's what's going to be needed. And that's hard. That's harder than just doing an authoritarian approach. But we have to do that. And so, again, this is something where I just and others could help take the lead on identity because I figure if we don't get ahead of that and figure out a way to involve people to assert their identity, we will get pulled apart. The last thing I will say is what may sound terrifying to be going in the next five years to not be able to distinguish what's true and not, not true on the internet. I will submit that business for the last 3,000 years had had only one ethos, which is buyer beware, caveat emptor. And so the world we may be going into may be that we have to adopt the same approach to the internet, which is caveat internet. Assume everything you find on the internet until proven otherwise, or asserted otherwise, or confirmed by someone's identity otherwise, is untrue. Because unfortunately, what generative AI is going to do is just accelerate the challenges of actually distinguishing what's accurate versus what's not accurate online. OK, I'm going to say something extremely intense. I'll just say, wow, because the uh, your presentation, your dialogue, your scope uh, all your responses david we appreciate your input so very much um there's several of us on the side of the room saying okay we our list has gotten uh tenfold and in only an hour's presentation but we are very grateful we even the uh the virtual connection is a cool way of addressing this topic so i'm sorry you're not with us but i look forward to your engagement at our next event uh, which may be on this very topic, but thank you so much. And please let us give a very strong round of applause to David and his contribution. Thanks for having me. Happy to help in the future. Bye-bye.